Okay, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us again for our COVID series of webinars. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here on Wednesday morning with these webinars as we do every week, bringing you the updates and information as it pertains to everything COVID related. My name is Jason Flynn, and I'm the Director of Human Resources and Client Services for Prestige Employee Administrators. Along with us this morning is Tax Manager Carol Sawyer, as always. Uh, Andy Lumash wanted to be with, the, be with us this morning again, but unfortunately he will not be able to join us. Um, however, we have two familiar names along with us this morning in Seth Peretta and Malcolm Slee. Both Seth and Malcolm are principals at the Groom Law Group and neither are strangers to our webinars. So it's certainly nice to have everyone with us again uh, for the webinar this morning. As for today's agenda, Seth and Malcolm will be discussing some new guidance from the Small Business Administration and the Treasury. I will focus on the revised loan forgiveness application and the newly issued easy loan forgiveness application. From that point, we'll review uh, the immigration proclamation signed by the President earlier this week and how it affects visas, and then slide right back into the Q&A section that Carol and I normally handle towards the end of each webinar. As a reminder, all participants will be muted throughout the webinar. However, if you have a question, I urge you to use the Q&A feature within the webinar and direct the questions to the panelists. As always, we'll do our best to answer all the questions that come in from all of the attendees. Um, if not, if we aren't able to get to one of the questions, we will certainly reach out to you individually and make sure we get those answered for you. A copy of the presentation will be available in the COVID-19 Resource Center of the Prestige website following the webinar. So just to give everybody an update on, on where we are right now and where, where I'm going to pass it off to, um, again, Seth and Malcolm are both principals at the Groom Law Group. They are certainly keyed in with legislative updates on the Hill um, and within the country as a whole. So it's nice to have them with us again today to go through a lot of the things that I worked through over the agenda, and I am happy to pass it off to Seth and Malcolm. Thank you very, very much, Jason. Appreciate it. Uh, this is Seth Ferretta. Very happy to be here with my colleague, Malcolm Slee. I felt like you probably all had grown weary of hearing my voice for the last few weeks, so I thought I would rope back in Malcolm, who I think you all uh, may recall from a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, we're going to tag team this session today. So in terms of uh, the new SBA and Treasury guidance, which is on the next slide here, we're going we're gonna to walk through basically what has, what has happened. And, you know, as you guys may recall, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act was uh, passed on June 5th. Um, this was an act that liberalizes rules greatly. On June 8th, we got the joint statement from SBA and Treasury, and now we've gotten a flurry of new additional interim final rules from SBA and Treasury, basically revising their existing PPP regulations in order to update them to reflect the enactment of the PPPFA. And as they've done that, they've provided a host of clarifying guidance on some of the provisions in the Flexibility Act that we talked about over the last couple of weeks. Um, they also issued a series of revised or new applications and instructions. You'll see there on, the, on June 12th, they issued a new borrower loan application. That's not the forgiveness application, but that was the general loan application for the PPP. Then on uh, uh, June 17th, uh, most notably, they issued a revised loan forgiveness application. And then on the 17th, the same day, they issued that simplified easy forgiveness loan application. And we're going to talk about both the revised loan application as well as the new simplified easy loan application as well today. All right, so moving on to the next slide here, I just want to highlight this one point. It's really important for folks to understand the deadline to apply for and actually get approved. It should say deadline to apply for and have a PPP loan approved. It is June 30th of 2020. Um, it is not 1231 of 2020, which was, I think, what many folks had believed would be the case based on the Flexibility Act's uh, uh, statutory language, but SB and Treasury have made clear that it is June 30th. So if you have not applied for a PPP loan, 
you are in trouble because time is running out not only to apply but have it approved by the end of this month. All right, moving on now. One other thing we wanted to highlight, we walked through this about the 75% use requirement. Remember the PPP, PFA, basically uh, Congress did not like SBA and Treasury coming out with a requirement that 75% of the loan be used on eligible payroll costs. The PPPFA replaced that with a 60% use requirement. And as we talked about, we were a little bit concerned about how SBA uh, and Treasury might interpret that statutory language. They came out with a positive statement in that June 8th joint statement from SBA and Treasury. They came out again uh, uh, in the IFR that was issued with a positive statement that even if you don't use 60% of your loan proceeds on eligible payroll, you still will be, will be able to get amounts forgiven. It's just that your amount forgiven must be comprised of at least 60% of eligible payroll costs. So as we talked about on the next slide here, this is an example of how the 60% uh, use requirement applies in the context of forgiveness. This is the exact same example that we walked through last week. We're not going to walk through it here today, but for folks uh, who have questions about how it would apply, this is a pretty simple example of how it works. Um, the good news is that even if you don't use 60% uh, of the loan proceeds on eligible payroll, you can still get amounts forgiven. Now we're going to turn to really sort of new guidance, things we have learned uh, since last week's phone, uh, since last week's webinar. So moving on now to the next slide. As you guys know, this is where Malcolm and I are going to begin a sort of a back and forth. I'm going to tee up what the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, sorry, what the PPPFA, this is that second uh, piece of legislation enacted on June 5th. We talked about this last week and that there were a lot of open questions. I'm going to lay out what the statutory language says, and then Malcolm's going to tell us what we've learned just since last week on how SBA and Treasury are interpreting those statutory provisions. As you guys may recall, the CARES Act gave borrowers uh, an eight-week loan forgiveness covered period. That's the period of time during which they can incur uh, expenses, use their proceeds, and have those amounts forgiven. Uh, the PPPFA expanded that forgiveness period until the earlier of basically December 31st, 2020, or the close of 24 weeks after the loan origination date. For borrowers that got their loan prior to June 5th, they could elect to stay with an eight-week covered period if they wanted. There were a lot of questions. For example, can I pick a loan forgiveness period that is longer than eight weeks but less than 24 weeks? Can I seek forgiveness before the close of that 24-week period? Um, how do the various you know, safe harbors that we've talked about apply? Um, the good news is we have received some guidance on the flexibility that may be available to borrowers with respect to um, if they elect that 24-week extended covered period. Malcolm, can you share with us uh, what we've learned? Yeah, happy to, Seth. Um, so, you know, one of the questions we've been getting a lot is, okay, we know that under the Flexibility Act, it expanded the forgiveness covered period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Um, we know that if you got your loan before June 5th, you have the choice of either using the eight-week period or the 24-week period. But what if I wanted to have a uh, covered period that was somewhere between eight and 24 weeks? Is that permissible? Um, well, there's something in the guidance that suggests that you can, you know, go ahead and elect a, your own uh, customized covered period. You know, if you wanted a 12-week covered period or a 13-week covered period, nothing in the loan forgiveness application or the guidance specifically suggests that you can elect, um, again, you know, your sort of individualized covered period. However, um, we did get some really good news in the regulation that came out two days ago, which is the borrower does not have to wait to seek forgiveness until the close of the loan forgiveness uh, period, whether it's eight or 24 weeks, which is something, frankly, um, we did not expect, you know, based on the guidance that had come up to that point. It seemed as if you had to wait till the end of the uh, the, the close of the loan forgiveness period before you could actually apply for loan forgiveness. 
So this is going to be good news for a lot of borrowers. This was, again, a question we were getting a lot, which is if I used up my, my loan proceeds before the end of the covered period, can I go ahead and apply for loan forgiveness? And it appears the answer to that is yes. Um, now, by doing that, if you do choose to apply early uh, for loan forgiveness before the end of the uh, loan forgiveness period, in a sense, you, you will have sort of created your own customized covered period. So it's a little bit of a workaround. Um, there's nothing in the loan forgiveness application that suggested this would be the result. Again, this is something that just came out in a new rule that Treasury issued about two days ago. Um, so good news. Uh, we'll see if they revise the loan forgiveness application form. We're not really anticipating that they're going to at this point. Um, but something that borrowers are going to want to keep in mind. Now, there is an important caveat to this uh, rule about applying for forgiveness early, which is covered in the, the bullet right at the bottom of the slide. Um, if you apply for forgiveness before the end of your loan forgiveness covered period, and you have reduced any employee salaries or wages in excess of 25%, then you must account for that reduction for the entire covered period, be it eight weeks or 24 weeks. And this gets to that rule, I know we've covered it on prior webinars, which is your uh, total loan forgiveness amount can be reduced if you cut um, the wages or salaries of your employees who make less than $100,000 during the covered period after you get your loan. This was a rule that SBA and Treasury came up with to make sure that um, you weren't sort of, you know, trying to game the way the penalty works by uh, truncating your loan forgiveness covered period. And if we can move to the next slide, we have an example that explains how this works. So yeah. on, under this, do you want to cover this, Seth, or do you want me to do it? No, please. Be okay. Yeah, so under this example, we've got a, the borrower's name is Joe's Hardware. Uh, they applied for and received a PPP loan with a 24-week loan forgiveness covered period. And Joe's Hardware reduced one of their full-time employees' weekly salary from $1,000 per week during the uh, reference period to $700 per week during the covered period after they got the loan. That employee continued to work as a full-time employee. So they've had a reduction from $1,000 a week to $700 per week, basically 30%. The first $250 of that reduction, the 25% the of the $1,000 is disregarded for the purposes of calculating the salary hourly wage reduction. And then as you, we discussed under the new guidance, Joe's Hardware can now go ahead and file for loan forgiveness as soon as it's used up all of its PPP loan proceeds. However, when it is listing the salary hourly wage reduction on its uh, loan forgiveness application for that employee, Joe's Hardware is going to have to list the $50 reduction in excess of the 25% multiplied by the full 24-week covered period. So that's $50 times 24. So they're going to be listing a salary hourly wage reduction for the employee of $1,200. So the bottom line here is that Joe's Hardware can apply for forgiveness once it's used up all of its PPP uh, loan proceeds, but it can't um, limit the amount of its penalty because it's applying early. It's got to assume that the salary hourly wage reduction is going to continue to apply for the full 24-week covered period. And of course, if, you know, if there was a chance that the Joe's Hardware thought they were going to receive Store the you know the salary back up to uh, you know pre-pandemic levels. There might be value in obviously waiting to seek forgiveness. Um, so this is one of the situations where you have the ability to seek forgiveness once your loan proceeds have been used, but you'll want to think really carefully about whether that makes sense if you effectively would have to extrapolate and carry forward for the full duration of that 24-week period. Uh, you know, a uh, salary hourly reduction amount that would reduce your loan forgiveness amounts. So good decision point for folks here to think through. Obviously, what we don't have are a lot of details around how this rule works. So what if you have someone who in week two, four, six, eight, twelve 
had their salary reduced or their hourly wages reduced. Um, you know, question is like, how do you apply that in across the sort of 24 week period? Do you take the average and then apply it for the remaining weeks that are that are that are in that 24 week period? We don't really have you know more understanding, so I think working with your lender would be important. The other question we've gotten is, well, what about folks who you know haven't had a salary hourly wage reduction, apply for forgiveness after week 13 when they've used all their proceeds up? And then in week 14, want to reduce salary and hourly wages beyond 25%. Does, is that a problem? You know, honestly, we don't know. Um, and so that's a situation where, um, you know, unless and until your loan forgiveness amount has actually been approved by SBA back to the lender, and you've been noticed uh, that that has occurred, I think, you know, it raises interesting questions of after you seek forgiveness to your lender, but you've not yet received approval and you take action, say, over the course of that remaining 24 week period, would you have a notice or an obligation to notice the lender? Um, all things I think that may be uh, important to consider and, and certainly looking at your loan documents as well may provide some insight. All right, moving on now to the next slide here. This is a lot easier and much faster to talk about, which is, as you guys may recall, uh, under the CARES Act, there was uh, two safe harbors. One was uh, regarding where you have a FTE reduction, and one is where you have a salary and hourly wage reduction. And as you may recall, under the CARES Act, if you were able to restore your full-time equivalent headcount back up to sort of pre-pandemic levels by June 30th, then you were able to avoid a reduction to your forgivable amount. Um, that that date of June 30th was struck from the CARES Act by the Flexibility Act and was replaced with December 31st of 2020. A lot of questions came up, which is, well, what if my 24-week period ends, say, um, you know, uh, in August or September? Uh, do I need to wait until December 31st in order to see whether I'm able to avail myself of that FTE reduction safe harbor? And Malcolm, I think we've got some good news. Yeah, so we did get some good news, which is the loan forgiveness application itself um, suggests that you, for the purpose of, of doing these uh, determinations of whether or not you meet the safe harbor, you can look at your data as of the date that the loan forgiveness application itself is submitted. So, you know, we had been concerned that this, these new rules would mean that you would have to wait until December 31st to file your, your loan forgiveness application in order to demonstrate whether or not you met one of these safe harbors. Um, really good news because it sounds like SBA and Treasury are applying a more liberal interpretation where if you can meet the safe harbor early, you can go ahead and just get your loan forgiveness application in and it'll be processed. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, on the next slide, you know, basically we have, it's, it's the exact same new guidance, just in the context of the salary, salary, salary hourly wage reduction safe harbor, which is if you're able to restore salary and hourly wages back to that pre-pandemic level. Uh, it used to be by June 30th, that was replaced with December 31st in the, in the uh, Flexibility Act, but the regulators have made clear in recent guidance that again, uh, if you seek forgiveness prior to that December 31st date, uh, your, 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 uh, you can measure your sort of compliance with that safe harbor based on the date of the loan forgiveness application. So, you know, good news as Malcolm explained. All right, now we're gonna move on to another slide that's not quite so simple, but it's really, really, really important for folks. And I think it may be very, very good news for many borrowers which is that the Flexibility Act created two exceptions to when someone would have their forgiveness amount reduced because they reduced uh, uh, employee headcount. And you'll see there in that first bullet that's in black, there's two exceptions provided for by the Flexibility Act. The first one is in, is, is, it begins with that, that it's option A that the borrower can in good faith document two things. 
that they were unable to rehire individuals who were employees uh, on February 15th. So let's say, you know, let's say um, going back to our example, um, gosh, I can't remember the person who was, who was uh, terminated, but um, let's say you have someone who was employed on February 15th, um, you terminate them because of COVID or otherwise, you try to rehire them and you're unable, but you document that. And you're unable to hire a similarly qualified employee to fill that position on or before December 31st of 2020, or presumably Malcolm, I'm assuming that's the date upon which I seek forgiveness. So I'm not mm -hmm. able to hire the same guy and I'm not able to hire a similarly qualified guy um, before the time in which I seek forgiveness. That is one exception. The other exception, and this is the really important one, is if I'm able to document that I was unable to return to the same level of business activity as I was operating at before February 15th, 2020, due to HHS, CDC, OSHA requirements or guidance relating to COVID-19, such as, you know, stay at home uh, orders or the like, or because I was required to do social distancing and I couldn't have as many people on the floor, or I couldn't have as many people um, in the customer sales or call center. Um, all reasons why you might not be able to return to the same level of business activity. Now, Business activity doesn't necessarily mean revenue. Um, it's, it's a different term, right? Activity is not revenue. So I think there's a lot of flexibility here. But Malcolm, what have the regulators told us about how to interpret these two new exceptions? Yeah, and again, we, you know, I think we got some really good guidance here. So again, Congress and the Flexibility Act, they, they created two different ways you can avoid the SDE reduction factor. So we'll call the first way the uh, inability to rehire test, and then the second way the, um, the inability to return to same level of business activity test. So let's start by talking about the guidance relating to the inability to rehire test. Um, now this was, a, this was a new rule that Congress came up with, but it really was a variation on a, a exception that SBA and Treasury had come up with on their own, and it, you know, put in regulations and had put in the original loan forgiveness application. They had a similar concept, which was if you were unable to rehire uh, somebody that you had laid off, um, you could avoid the SDE reduction factor. Um, the good news here is that SBA and Treasury are going to keep their, their same regu regulatory exceptions, but they slightly tweaked what they had previously since Congress had come up with their own rule. So under the new SBA Treasury regulatory exception, if you make a good faith written offer to restore the reduced hours of an employee at the same salary and wages, same number of hours prior to the reduction of hours, and the employee rejects the offer to go back to full hours, and you as the borrower, you maintain the records documenting that you made that offer and it was rejected, then the employee won't count against the SBA reduction factor. So you've got a statutory exception under the Flexibility Act if you're unable to rehire individuals. And then you've got this regulatory exception under SBA Treasury rules that if you're unable to get an employee to go back to full-time hours, you can also qualify for the FTE exception. Now, SBA and Treasury um, had some additional regulatory exceptions as well, which was if you fired somebody for good cause, or if somebody voluntarily resigned, or if they requested a voluntary, uh, if they voluntarily requested a reduction in hours um, and you gave it to them, those folks would also not count against your FDE reduction factor. And all of those rules still apply as well. So we've got a, we've got a number of different avenues in which we might be able to um, demonstrate that the FDE reduction factor shouldn't apply. Um, You'll see there now, if you are using this new Flexibility Act exception that based on the inability to rehire individuals, even if you made them an offer, um, the guidance that came out a couple of days ago suggests that one requirement is going to be that you are going to have to inform the 
applicable state unemployment insurance office of the employee's rejection of your rehire offer, and you're gonna have to do that within 30 days of the rejection. And what the guidance says is that there's gonna be forthcoming guidance that's going to explain exactly how that requirement is going to be applied. So that's something we're gonna to have to uh, keep our eyes and ears open uh, regarding that. But you should definitely keep it in mind. Um, you should absolutely maintain records of any written offer to rehire, any written record of rejection, uh, any efforts to hire similarly qualified individuals. If you wanna take advantage of this exception, um, you're, you're going to, you may have to demonstrate to SBA or Treasury or your lender um, that you have a basis for claiming this exception. So that's another very important thing to keep in mind. Um, moving to the, the sort of the second prong here, the second exception that Congress created, inability to return to the same level of business activity. So again, you know, folks were wondering, when is that measured as of? Do I have to wait until the end of 2020 to apply for forgiveness and demonstrate that, you know, it, 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 here it is, it's the end of 2020 and I still have not been able to get back to the same level of business activity that I was at previously. Um, the good news is, you don't have to wait until the end of 2020. Again, whenever you get around to filing your loan forgiveness application, as long as you can demonstrate that you are unable to return to the same level of business activity when you submit your application, you should be in good shape. So on this slide, we've got an example, um, which is more or less pulled from the regulation that came out a couple of days ago. Um, and it's a pretty simple example, but um, again, I think it's good news because it, it gives you some indication of how broadly this exception can apply. So we've got Lana's lotions, they sell beauty products both online and in a retail store. And then after they got their uh, PPP loan or during the period um, for which they had their PPP loan, the, uh, their local government had ordered all non-essential businesses that includes Lana's lotions to shut down based on the uh, COVID-19 guidance issued by CDC in March of this year. And Lana Lotion's business activities were reduced compared to its activity before February 15, 2020 because of that shutdown. That's the case, Lana's Lotion's, even if they reduce their FTEs during the covered period, they will not have their uh, loan forgiveness amount reduced, provided that they maintain records showing uh, that the local government you know, issued that shutdown order and they can demonstrate the related reduction in its business activity. Um, so a couple of takeaways here. One is, if you read the statutory rule, it suggests that the, business, the reduction in business activity has to be based on orders from three federal agencies, which are OSHA, HHS, and the CDC. Now, SBA is interpreting this rule to include both direct and indirect compliance with those, um, those federal orders. So in other words, just because if your state or local government um, was following, you know, CDC directions, for example, when they when they issued a shutdown order, that's still going to qualify you for the um, this business activity exception. It doesn't have to be, you know, literally a order from one of those federal agencies that shut you down. And then the second takeaway here, I think, is just, you know, for folks to get a taste of how broad this exception can apply. I mean, again, you know, we think probably 99%, 95% maybe of the businesses in this country are going to be able to take advantage of this exception. It's very difficult to think of a business that hasn't had their um, business activity reduced since February 15th based on the pandemic. So this is you know, a very valuable exception and it's probably gonna be very broadly utilized. Thank, thank you, Malcolm. I think that's a well stated uh, concluding remarks on this uh, new exception, I think it likely will be hugely helpful for borrowers in avoiding a reduction to the forgivable amount based on a, a headcount reduction. All right, now we're going to move on to another hotly discussed issue, which is how to apply the $100,000 of uh, cash comp limit. So as you all probably know or may recall, the CARES Act had a provision that only allowed for a pro rata share um, of compensation uh, up to 100 case of, sorry, let me, let me step back. So for folks with annualized cash comp exceeding 
uh, $100,000 or more, you can only take into consideration $100,000 of their annual cash compensation when determining the amount of eligible payroll costs that would be available for forgiveness. Now, as you may recall, for employees and for owners during that eight-week period, it was effectively you know, capped at 15385 could not be more. Um, now that we have the PPPFA and you can you can have a 24 week covered period, um, the question has become, well, how do I apply that $100,000 cash complement? Well, for employees during that 24 week covered period, it's pretty simple. 24 weeks is three times eight weeks. You take 15,385 and you multiply it by three and you end up at $46,154. So that's the total maximum amount of uh, compensation that could be taken into account uh, for an employee during the course of that 24-week covered period. But interestingly, if you look at that last bullet on this slide, for owners, uh, for, for, for owners of a borrower that is using a 24-week covered period, the cap is not 46,154 or three times $15,000. It is $20,000. Uh, $20,833. So that's sort of interesting. And uh, we have an example on the next slide that is intended to highlight why it appears SBA and Treasury has come to this conclusion. Obviously, probably unwelcome news for some folks, um, but Malcolm, you want to walk us through our example involving Gary Greedy? Yep, exactly. And we should note, you know, we're not <laughs> we're not necessarily endorsing this reasoning, but this is how SBA um, explained it in their regulations. So it's sort of tried to convert it into an example. Um, and hopefully everyone has, has drunk their coffee this morning because there is going to be math involved. Um, so in this example, Gary Greedy, uh, you'll you'll see why he's called that. Operates a consultancy building called Greedy Incorporated. He made $300,000 net profit in 2019, so obviously over the $100,000, you know, cap that applies. Uh, Greedy Incorporated also had one employee named Eddie who performed office management and bookkeeping, and Eddie made $125,000 in 2019, so again, over the $100,000 cap. Um, after the Flexibility Act passed, Greedy Inc. applies for and receives a PPP loan. Now, as folks probably all hopefully remember, um, the maximum loan, am loan amount for your PPP loan was two and a half times your average monthly payroll for 2019, but you couldn't go over uh, $100,000 in costs for any particular employee on an annualized basis. So the way that worked out was that um, the maximum amount that you could really get as a PPP loan for any particular employee was $20,833. That would be a $100,000 salary uh, for two and a half months, basically. If you take $100,000, divide it by 12, multiply it by two and a half, you come up with $20,833. So Gritty Incorporated's loan amount is just that $20,833 for Gary, the $20,833 for Eddie, you know, multiply it by two, and you come out with a total loan amount of $41,667. Now, without this SBA Treasury rule, Gary could say, well, hmm, you know, I un understand that under the Flexibility Act, I can reduce my full-time workforce and still qualify for full loan forgiveness. All I have to do is demonstrate that I was unable to return to the same uh, level of business activity that I was at on February 15th. So Gary, living up to his name, decides to fire Eddie and pay himself the full $41,667 over the 24-week loan forgiveness cover period, figuring he's going to get that entire amount forgiven his payroll costs. It's going to convert to a grant. He won't have to re even repay it. Um, this was not the result SBA wanted because under you know these uh, the scenario, Gary would get a windfall, obviously more money than he should be getting. And Eddie's paycheck wasn't protected. It's called the Paycheck Protection Program. So SBA came up with this rule that effectively caps uh, the compensation for owner employees that are using the 24-week period at the maximum amount they could have claimed as part or applied for as part of their PPP loan 
which would be that two and a half months of uh, their their salary again at that annualized cap of twenty thousand eight hundred thirty three dollars. You obviously don't have this problem with the eight week covered period because you're not getting over that um, two and a half month uh, amount. You're only dealing effectively with two months worth of comp. So you don't. That's why the the comp under the or the comp caps under the eight week amount are the same for employees and owner employees. But SBA felt like they had to come up with this different rule for owner employees under the 24 week covered period. And actually, Malcolm, just to, and Jason, if we can go back one slide, actually back to um, the administration of 100K cash complement slide. Malcolm, I'm looking at that bottom bullet, and it says the cap is the lower of 20,833 or eight weeks. Shouldn't that be 10 week? Um, eight week would be yeah, 15,000. Yeah, right. That's a good point. Yeah. We should probably fix that. Yeah. So that should be two and a half months. I apologize everyone. We just were looking. I just saw that as we were moving through. So that should be 10 week equivalent of 2019 comp because to Malcolm's point, they're letting you get basically the equivalent of two and a half, uh, uh, months, which was the basis for your loan amount in the first place. So we will, we will work with Prestige to fix that last bullet. But for that last bullet, where it says eight weeks, it should say 10 weeks. And that's gonna be really important now when we go back to the slide that we now should be on, which is more guidance regarding owner slash self-employment compensation. So as Malcolm just explained, where you have an owner employee or a self-employed individual, when you're looking at the amount of their compensation that is eligible for forgiveness, it's basically going to be for the eight week covered period, the lesser of eight weeks of 2019 comp or 15,385. If they have a 24 week covered period, it's gonna be the lesser of two and a half months or say 10 weeks of 2019 comp or 20,833. That's where we get that 10 week uh, correction that we just walked through. Now, when you're looking at measuring 2019 compensation, the regulators have provided a, a plethora of additional information on what types of 2019 comp can be taken into consideration for purposes of uh, determining uh, the maximum amount of uh, uh, owner, employee, self-employed individual comp that can be taken into consideration here for forgiveness. And we're not going to walk through it all here. It's right here on this slide. And I know Carol and Jason and folks are uh, focused on all of this very, very carefully. But if you have a C-Corp or an S-Corp or your general partner, or you're self-employed, um, they have provided some helpful additional clarifying guidance on how to calculate the 2019 employee cash comp for purposes of applying that, that 100K comp limitation. All right, now we're gonna move on to our next slide here. Uh, this is related to the extension of the loan deferral period. As we talked about in the CARES Act, there was a, um, it allowed for the deferral of basically principal payment, interest, and fees. Um, SBA and Treasury came out and basically said it was going to be six months. It was a somewhat um, conservative interpretation of the statute. Um, because now we have the extension of the loan forgiveness period uh, to 24 weeks, which is effectively you know, six times for that sort of six months, Congress extended the deferral period. So now you really have until 10 months after the close of the covered period or the date of loan forgiveness if uh, is, a, is, a, is approved if earlier. Um, Malcolm, in terms of guidance from the regulators, have they given us some clarifying uh, or some further uh, understanding as to how this will be applied? Yeah, nothing too earth shattering here, but I think it's it's helpful because another question we get a lot is, okay, well, you know, after I submit my loan forgiveness uh, application, then what happens? And so the new guidance sheds a little bit of light on that. Um, after you file your loan forgiveness application, um, the lender is, is obviously going to go to SBA um, and because they want to be reimbursed for the full amount that you're claiming as loan forgiveness, um, they'll hear back from SBA as to whether or not you know, the full amount of the loan forgiveness has um, been approved or whether, you know, only a portion has been approved or if no amount of the loan is eligible for forgiveness. 
Um, the lender is then responsible for notifying the borrower uh, when they are remitted the forgiveness amount by SBA, or if SBA determines no amount of the loan is eligible for, for forgiveness, they, they've got to notify the borrower of that as well. And then they've got to notify the borrower the date as of which the first payment is due if applicable. Um, I assume we've probably talked about this on prior webinars, but the Flexibility Act provides that if you, as the borrower, don't apply for loan forgiveness within 10 months after the last day of the covered period, that's when the deferral period ends. Um, at that point, you've got to start paying principal and interest. And again, the guidance suggests that the borrower at, in these circumstances, I mean, I'm sorry, the lender under these circumstances has to notify you as the borrower of the date your first payment is due. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. It's very, very helpful. Now we're going to move on to probably what some of you wanted to talk about, which is the revised loan forgiveness application and the simplified application. I have some, some good news and some bad news. As we look at the revised loan forgiveness application, um, the good news is it has been revised to reflect the changes dictated by the Flexibility Act. The good news is that when we walk through those part one, part two, and part three uh, series around how to complete the loan forgiveness application, that remains completely applicable. Uh, the bad news is they haven't really simplified the base loan forgiveness application. So what we have here, you may recall this graphic from our three-part series. We've got that loan forgiveness application, document one. We've got the schedule A, document two. We've got the wonderful tables one and two on the Schedule A worksheet, which is document three, and then we've got the optional demographic form document four. All of the same general rules, concepts, principles, the same forms all still apply. The instructions to the forms have, uh, uh, have generally been revised to provide some clarifying guidance to reflect the fact of the PPPFA. Um, that you know, those changes are ones that we've walked through today. So the good news is you've already learned about sort of how they've revised the loan forgiveness application because we've just walked through the guidance that the regulators have provided with respect to how to complete the, these, uh, these forms. The good news, the other I'd say good news, besides the fact that all of that time we spent together was not in vain, is that uh, they've issued a new loan forgiveness application that is a simplified form or an easy form. And this was released by Treasury on June 17th of 2020. Um, this was largely in response to stakeholder concerns, Congress, AICPA, small business uh, representatives, NAPIO, um, that basically the loan forgiveness application was incredibly complex. And for many small businesses that may have not had, you know, material, material reductions in headcount, or maybe they had no employees, um, that the form was unduly burdensome and time consuming. So the new loan forgiveness application EZ, or simplified form, allows borrowers that fall within one of these following three categories to basically complete the simple form. Now, one thing to keep in mind, while there are three categories of borrowers, there's only one simplified form. So, you know, it's not like if you fall into bucket one, there's a form for bucket one, or if you fall in bucket two, there's a form for bucket two. There's one form for borrowers that fall into one of the three following categories. So you'll see there the first category is for self-employed individual, individuals, independent contractors or sole props who had no employees when they applied for the PPP loan and did not include any employee salaries in their monthly payroll amounts that gave rise to their loan for, uh, that gave rise to their loan uh, their loan amount. So if you were self-employed, IC or sole prop, you had no employees when you applied for the loan and did not include employee salaries in your 2.5 times you know monthly payroll when you applied for the loan, you can use the EZ. The second category is for, you know, uh, entities that have both employers and employees and where they did not reduce salary or hourly wages by 25% for employees making less than 100K, right? So basically it didn't trigger a salary hourly wage reduction. 
and they did not reduce the number of employees or average paid hours of employees between January 1, 2020 and the end of the covered period. So again, basically these are employers that didn't reduce headcount and didn't reduce salary and hourly wages in such a way that it would affect their forgivable amount. For those folks, they can use the simplified form. The third category is employers that also did not reduce their salary and hourly wages below 25% for employees making less than 25K and they were unable to operate during the covered period at the same business level of activity as before February 15th of 2020. This is that new Flexibility Act exception that Malcolm walked through involving Lana's lotion. And so if you're an employer and basically you didn't reduce salary and hourly wages below 25% and you were unable to operate at the same business level, again, you're not subject to any reduction to your forgivable amount under the guidance, therefore, you can use the easy form as well. Well, Malcolm, what do I get if I get to use just the easy form? What's the benefit of the simplified or easy form as uh, we see on the next slide here? Yeah, this is exciting. This is a major treat for PPP junkies. So if you haven't seen the easy application yet, um, you can go on the SBA Treasury website, check it out yourself. But Look at that, just one page, uh, no Schedule A, no Schedule A worksheet. Um, again, for those of you who sat through our, our walkthrough of the uh, regular application, you'll recall having, you know, the, having to figure out FTE scores for all your employees and list any salary or hourly wage reductions, and you gotta list all the employees and list all their comp and their EIN. None of that has to happen if you're able to use the EZ form. It's just literally this one page where you fill out the data. There's another page where you, you know, initial the, the form to certify that everything you're saying is accurate. And then the third page is the optional demographic information. Um, so if you're able to use the EZ application, uh, it is going to make your life much simpler. So there is some good news. Um, so that's what we were planning to cover today. We hope it was helpful information, uh, and I'll turn it back now to Jason and to Carol. Thank you, Malcolm. Thanks. Thank you to both uh, Malcolm and Seth. Um, both these gentlemen have been mainstays within our webinars uh, for the past few months, and the information that they bring to us is extremely informative and useful, so we, we, we definitely appreciate um, the participation in the webinars. So I'd like to pivot or shift gears a little bit to talk about the uh, new immigration proclamation that the president signed earlier this week. You know, naturally, immigration has been a hot button lately and mostly overall an important topic for the current president, presidential administration as a whole. So over the past couple of days, we've seen more information come out over this new immigration <clears throat> over this new immigration proclamation. So we wanted to take some time to review some of the updates that we've seen come down the line over this past week because it does affect or could affect hiring practices for a lot of organizations. So as I mentioned on this past Monday, the president did sign a proclamation that could have a profound impact on many businesses, not just within New York, but certainly around the country. The idea behind this new rule is that it restricts foreign nationals from outside the U.S. from using certain temporary employment-based visas throughout the end of the year. The proclamation also extends the green card ban, which was enacted in April, also through the end of the year. The White House said that the order was really issued in response to the country's exceptionally high unemployment in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. So if for those of you that have been keeping track of the numbers, you know, officially over 20 million people are counted as unemployed by the Department of Labor, while the unemployment rate is, is really at a staggering 16.4%. So again, the reasoning behind this move, as we are told, is to preserve jobs amid the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus. So administration officials state that the executive order will suspend access to uh, a number of different areas. You know, this is going to affect H-1B visas used by professional and tech workers, 
uh, as well as H-2B visas for low-skilled jobs. You know, these are jobs commonly used by seasonal workers in landscaping and in the hospitality industry. You know, also H-4 visas for spouses of certain visa holders, uh, as well as J-1 visas for those participating in work and student exchanges, um, and of course L-1 visas for executives and managers transferred within companies. You know, these will all be suspended through December 31st, <clears throat> 2020, and the effective date of the new non-immigrant visa entry bans is today, June 24th. Now, the proclamation, we're told, will be reviewed on a periodic basis where the Department of Homeland Security, along with the Department of Later, Labor and the State Department, can recommend modifications to the restrictions on both the immigrant and non-immigrant visa holders subject to these entry restrictions. So as we move over to the second slide regarding the immigration proclamation, <clears throat> we want to talk about the, uh, the new entries the new entry bans application on non-immigrant visa holders. The entry restrictions will only apply to individuals who meet all the following criteria that we see. Let's make sure we are on the right slide. Here we go. So this includes individuals who are outside the United States on the effective date of this proclamation, which is, again, today, Wednesday, June 24th. Also those that do not have a valid non-immigrant visa as of the effective date of June 24th, and individuals that do not have an official travel document other than a visa you know, that was valid on this date, June 24th, or issued any date after that which permits them to travel to the United States and seek entry or admission. Now, as we're currently aware, any, indiv any individuals at your company that had a visa in one of the above reference categories before today and have entered the country before this Wednesday will be able to re-enter the United States. If you just received your visa on Thursday or any time thereafter, you will not be able to enter under this ban without a waiver. Do not expect these waivers will be easy to get. On a similar note, if you got your visa last month but you have yet to travel to the United States on that visa, you will be stuck outside the U.S. if you try to come here on Wednesday or any time thereafter unless you obtain those difficult to obtain waivers. So it's important to note that visa holders already in the U.S. or with already approved visas are exempted or exempt from this ban, as are healthcare workers focused on treating and researching COVID-19 and those working in the nation's food supply chain. Foreign national workers inside the U.S. may continue to apply for extensions um, of their currently valid visa status or seek an adjustment or change of status. So just to wrap up some of these changes and these slides on uh, these immigration changes, you know, and again, as, as mentioned in the beginning of this piece, clamping down on the many areas of, of immigration has been a, a staple of this administration. Unfortunately, the concern around this is that it could restrict the hiring pool for organizations within the U.S. Clearly, it's been a changing landscape and could go through more, more reform. You know, if you do have any questions or are looking for any guidance around these visa changes, I urge you to contact your support, te your support team at Prestige. Um, also keep an eye out for future communications from Prestige, which will detail any of these immigration legislative updates. So <clears throat> with that being said, I'd like to move on to the frequently asked questions section of the webinar before we wrap things up. And Carol and I will begin now. So first question we have here is, how long do you have to get the FTE count back to original during the covered period? Ah, great question. Um, utilizing the FTE safe harbor um, that was discussed by Malcolm and Seth earlier, you need to have it restored as of the date of forgiveness or December 31st, 2020. Um, the PPFA extended that deadline recognizing that a lot of businesses haven't been able to get up to full force because 
the economy has not rebounded yet, and the restrictions on business have not been um, released in many areas of the country. So you need to have it to qualify for the safe harbor. You need to have it restored um, by the date of forgiveness, although there is also then the safe harbor of, if you, since you have not been able to uh, arrive back at the same level of business because of the shutdowns, that gives you the exception for the FTE um, safe harbor. Great. Next question we have is, our eight-week covered period has ended, but our business has not been fully restored due to shutdowns. Is there any penalty or reduction in forgiveness if I lay people off? There is no, when using the eight-week covered period and the eight-week covered period has ended, there is no penalty for laying people off or no reduction in forgiveness. Um, as Malcolm and Seth mentioned earlier, if you are using the 24-week and you apply for loan forgiveness prior to the end of it, we do not know um, the ramifications of then laying off. So say you um, apply for forgiveness at the end of week 10, you've spent all your money, you meet the 60-40 split and all of that, Laying off in week 11 might be an issue because it is the entire 24-week covered period. So we will either await further guidance or speak with your lender on that. They may have received some of their own guidance. Okay, on this next slide here, our first question would be, if we are on a semi-monthly payroll, are we still able to choose the 24-week flexibility? All loans that were funded prior to June 5th have the choice between eight weeks and 24 weeks, regardless of your pay cycle. Pay cycle only came into play um, in choosing the alternate covered period uh, with the eight weeks where you were able to start your eight week covered period on the uh, first day of the next full payroll cycle. Um, but anyone funded before June 5th is eligible for either eight weeks or 24 weeks. All right, next question we have here is, if we prefer the eight-week covered period in regards to our payroll costs, can we still use the remainder of our funds on covered expenses beyond the eight-week period? You need to spend the money in whatever covered period you pick. If you choose eight weeks, you need to spend all the money in the eight weeks. Or once again, it's a lot of the costs are paid or incurred, so the payments need to be made on the next regular pay date. Um, but if at the end of eight weeks you haven't spent all of the money on your 60-40 split, that's why the PPTFA came out with that new 24-week covered period that can be utilized. And the next question, I will ask the question because this is a question for Jason. Is there an official guide that we have to follow to reopen our business? Thank you, Carol. There is, there's a lot of guidance out there um, that employers can use to help guide them through reopening their workplace in a safe way, right? That's really what we're looking for. Um, our suggestions would be, you know, a couple of different areas. One, you definitely want to refer to your state and local guidelines, the New York.gov website, the New Jersey website. Your state websites all have a lot of detail on how to open, what you need to do to follow by these guidelines, and it's always safe to, to abide by those guidelines. You know, also, Prestige, as we've spoken in, in previous webinars, Prestige has put together a return to work packet for um, anybody that would like to visit the website and look at it. We've put a lot of work into it, using guidance from state guidelines and attorneys to put forth a safe way to help you reopen your office and keep your employees safe and comfortable. So I'd urge you to take a look at the COVID-19 Resource Center within the Prestige site as well. And of course, you can always reach out to your HR business partner for more support along those lines. Next slide. I'm taking the questions back, Carol. Um, have there been any additional changes to how we calculate FTEs for loan forgiveness since the initial guidance? or is still calculating it by week? Yes, the FTE calculation did not change. For the covered period, whether eight weeks or 24 weeks, it is a weekly average. So you add up 
all of the hours for the eight weeks, divide by eight and divide that by 40. Um, what it is important to note, um, and Seth and Malcolm had mentioned this in a previous webinar, is to use the same methodology. There are some um, different ways of paying employees. The example that came up that is not a client of Prestige, but is an employer, that, uh, lots of employers are trucking firms. And they don't necessarily pay by hours and things. So the key is to use the exact same equation for calculating the FTEs and the look back period that you do in the covered periods so that you're comparing apples to apples. Great. Next question we have here is, when do I need to choose between the eight week and the 24 week covered period? That election is made on your forgiveness application. One of the first items in the top is to write down what your covered period is and you'll either write down an eight week period or a 24 week period. All right, beginning on this next slide, our question asks, what if you had employees use FFCRA emergency paid sick time? Is that an exception that won't reduce your loan forgiveness? Okay, so any wages paid under the FFCRA will not be included in the cash compensation reports that Prestige gives you for costs that are eligible for forgiveness. Um, you already received a tax credit for that money, so we can't submit it a second time. So while those wages will not be considered for forgiveness, it doesn't represent a wage reduction or anything like that. So it um, will reduce the amount eligible for forgiveness, but it won't reduce your forgiveness, if that makes sense. Great. Great. So how can you determine if you are eligible to use the easy form without going through the tedious calculations per employee? Technically, you do need to, um, but let's keep in mind for employers with, you know, I would say up to 10 employees, maybe even 20, you know what you've done. You know if you've laid anybody else off, you know if you've reduced anybody's hours, you know if you've reduced anybody's salary or wages by more than 25%. So we will be providing you with all of the reports that go with the full uh, application that then support the numbers you're going to write on the EZ form. Um, but it is a, a simpler process the smaller the company because you know, you know what's happened over the, the last eight weeks. Employers that are much larger, 50, 60 people, yes, you'll need to go through the calculations and have that as backup should your lender um, ask for it. Or once again, there is always the possibility that the SBA and Treasury later on down the line um, I don't recall off the top of my head the number of years they have left this open, could come back and say, show me, prove to me that this was what happened. So um, we will provide you with the reports. Great. I think we just have a few more questions here. This one states, if a company is experiencing declining sales, would it be best to elect the eight-week covered period for loan forgiveness? Um, remember that the, there is this new safe harbor um, that Seth and Malcolm talked about earlier, that businesses that are still impacted by the restrictions, and it did say direct or indirect. Um, so it may be uh, your store has been allowed to open. I mean, let's face it, restaurants have been open, but only able to do takeout. So while they are still open, they have been adversely affected by the shutdowns because their business has been restricted. So um, that's not a, a part of the decision for you to choose between eight weeks or 24 weeks. Okay, if I reduce the number of hours an employee works but pay the employee the same hourly wage, the employee will earn less during the covered period. Is this both an FTE reduction and a wage reduction? It is not, and I, I specifically just added this question because it's a point that I want to make sure that everybody understands. This is only an FTE reduction. The wage reduction is the rate, either the hourly rate or their annual salary. So if you had somebody that last year was making $90,000 a year, and you've reduced them to an equivalent salary of, say, $50,000 a year, but they're still coming in every day, working 40 hours a week, that's where that wage reduction is, that you would take account of it there. The 
Other example would be somebody makes $30 an hour, but you only have them coming in 30 hours a week. That is where you will see that reduction in the lower FTE for 30 hours a week, but you have left their hourly rate the same. All right. I believe this is our last slide with questions. Um, second to last question we have here is, if I choose a 24-week period and I spend all of the money before the end of the period, can I apply for forgiveness before the covered period ends? Yeah, Seth and Malcolm um, mentioned this, and I included this question, which had come to us last week. Um, just to reinforce this point, you're able to apply for forgiveness during your 24 weeks. The only caveat issue being if you have experienced a wage reduction of more than 25% for one of your employees, you will need to carry that calculation through the full 24 re weeks and reduce your forgiveness amount accordingly. And the last question of the day is for Jason. Can an employer be held liable if an employee tests positive for COVID-19 after returning to work? Yeah, this, this has been a popular question since um, we've begun the process of returning our employees to work. Um, it, you know, there's always a chance that um, employers could be held liable or at least be sued, but it would be an uphill battle. Uh, <clears throat> unlike healthcare providers, other businesses typically aren't obligated to follow federal safety guidelines to guard against contagion. So it's really up to the states and localities to set those standards. And of course, we've seen a lot of that during the COVID-19 period that we've been going through. So when sick employees seek damages, it's usually through workers' compensation, and even then they need to be able to prove that they contracted the virus at work. Not such an easy task. Our guidance is always to put your employees in a position to be safe. If you follow state and local guidelines and the procedures that are put in place to reopen, then you're doing your part as the employer to protect your employees. The COVID, also, the COVID-19 Resource Center on the Prestige website has a lot of tools that you can use to guide you with the return of your employees. I hope that helps out. So <clears throat> that wraps up our webinar today. Thank you um, again to Seth and Malcolm and Carol to, um, for participating in today's webinar. I'd like to remind everybody to um, keep an eye out for our weekly communications sent out to our clients regarding everything that's going on, COVID-related and otherwise. Um, also, the presentation will be on the website. And <clears throat> please stay tuned for next, the invitation for next week's webinar. Um, another couple points is I'd like everyone to, you know, check out our podcasts on the website, on the Prestige, on the Prestige website that we have, HR 15, it's a 15 minute podcast that explores a lot of different relevant areas. Uh, definitely interesting if you wanted to check that, that out. Um, and as always, please contact your support team at Prestige for any questions you might have. Thank you again, everybody, for spending some of your Wednesday with us today, and I look forward to speaking with everyone again next week.